The views and opinions of this broadcast do not reflect the views and opinions of Armed Media, Who New Productions and its affiliates. Enjoy the show. to all you can eat it's the podcast about deliciousness and i'm your host robert rosenthal and your chief recommendation officer excited about uh, tonight's show coming to you live from uh, from england from london england uh, home of the actual queen which is uh, only a fun coincidence because tonight's show is uh, pretty much predominantly about a place called Queens in, uh, in New York City. Now, for anybody who doesn't already know this, uh, New York City is uh, comprised of five boroughs, the largest in size of which is Queens, New York, and all you want to know is that uh, it has become one of the greatest uh, uh, food centers in, uh, certainly in the United States, but even beyond that. I mean, the New York Times recently named Queens one of the top 50 places to visit in the world. Why did they do that? Because uh, there is virtually no place more diverse than Queens, New York. I mean, 100 different cultures, 100 languages spoken, and uh, 100 different types of cuisines, which is why I'm particularly uh, thrilled uh, this evening to share with you uh, my conversation with uh, Drew Reed uh, Kerr, who is uh, a Queens guy himself, as am I to a large extent, and who is the brains behind a project called, well, the Queens Chef Project, in which he uh, interviews 50 chefs from Queens. He did this over the past year or so, and gets a story from each of them about the most important, most significant piece of cooking equipment that they own and use. So again, folks, uh, tune in for this right now because uh, it's a phenomenon. It's a great project. You'll learn a lot about Queens and the food there and a whole bunch of stuff about deliciousness, which, as you now know, is the very theme of all you can eat. So glad that you're all here. Hang on a second, and I will tune you into my conversation with Drew Kerr, the man behind the Queens Chef Project. Uh, hey, everybody. Uh, say hello to Drew Reed uh, Kerr, uh, who is a, uh, a, a friend and he's also the, uh, the man behind the Queen's Chef Project, which we're going to talk about. Uh, Drew Reed Kerr, welcome to All You Can Eat. It's the podcast about deliciousness. How are you? Rob, I'm, I feel satiated already. Good to see you. Good to hear you. Same, uh, same here. Thanks for doing it. Drew, uh, you know, uh, I always like to start at the beginning. Where, uh, where have I found you? Where are you seated these days? Uh, <laughs> in my den in the financial district area of Manhattan in New York City. Oh, well, you know, I, I know Manhattan and I, uh, and I know it well. And uh, before we tell people all about the Queen's Chef Project, which I'm, I'm really excited about for a lot of reasons. Um, Speaking of Queens, I'm going to say that uh, that you and I both uh, grew up there. Am I correct? That's true. What uh, what part of Queens are you from? Um, it started in Flushing, and then uh, in fourth grade, I moved to Howard Beach. Uh, and and then and to be honest with you, when I graduated college, I spent ten years in Briarwood. So I've had wow. extensive living, extensive living experience in Queens. Well, yeah, it's a lot of experience in Queens. Um, I'm, uh, I spent the first uh, uh, seven, eight years of my life in Kew Gardens. And I do feel uh, that, you know, when you look back, when I look back and people say, like, where are you from? I mean, I'm, I feel like I'm from there, e even though I ended up in another place, you know, for junior high school and high school. I think that my kind of um, my orientation, my experience is is very 
is very Queens. In, in fact, I think that so many of the memories that we have about food and our connection to food comes like really very early. Like what are your early kind of food memories, whether they were homemade or neighborhood? I remember my parents taking me and my brothers to a Chinese restaurant called Fortune Cookie. I don't re even remember where it is, right. um, but that was, you know, it was just sort of a tradition. We'd go every couple of weeks and my parents would order chow mein, like very Americanized Chinese food. Sure. Um, that was, a, that was th those, you know, early memories there. And then the other big memory I have is every Wednesday night, my mother would cook roast beef and chicken rice aroni. And it was my favorite dinner of the week. <laughs> <laughs> That's very funny. It's, I'm laughing for a variety of reasons because the whole subject of like what you grew up eating to me is fascinating. Like I grew up uh, also, as you know, you know, in, in, in Kew Gardens. And uh, here's what I remember. I remember the local pizza place, which I, uh, you, you know, uh, Danny's House of Pizza, which is still there run by the same family to this day. And I remember it vividly because up through, you, you know, like the first and second grade, they, they said you could go ahead and on Fridays only for lunch, we were able to walk uh, down Yellowstone Boulevard to get a slice of pizza. And, and so, you, you know, I, I mean, I still, to this day, like that's kind of my benchmark for like pizza. Cause that's what I remember, you know, that, and, and I think I, you know, the, the, the swirly grape and orange drink that they served in those cylindrical <laughs> metal cups with the white, with the white cups. But if I think of the neighborhood drew, I, I also remember the smell of chicken delight. Because there was the smell, of, <laughs> no, I, there was the I, smell I, of fried chicken in the air. I do remember my father on Sunday mornings occasionally walking over to the, um, the, the whatever place it was that you would buy the, uh, you know, the appetizing, you know, uh, uh, you know, bagels or some type of great, you know, like herring and, uh, you know, cream right. Sauce. And uh, you, I didn't, I hadn't really thought of this for a while, but when I was listening to your favorite meal of the week. My mother was not a great cook, uh, but my grandfather br uh, was a butcher in the Bronx, and he would bring over every week, you know, our supply of, of meat for the week. And our favorite meal was the lamb uh, chops. And uh, but when on one on those days that she wasn't going to cook. Uh, and then, by the way, she served that with, you know, like, honestly, it was like peas and carrots from a can or frozen, just, you know, whatever, and, and some, type, some type of other mush. But the, uh, my favorite thing was, um, was, the, was the chicken dinner in the TV dinner. Don't forget SpaghettiOs, too, my friend. No, I'm, that, I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm glad you brought it up. I was not a SpaghettiOs guy. We loved the, uh, the fried chicken uh, TV dinner. That was a good Swanson TV dinners. What's that one? Swanson. Swanson. Yeah, no, was totally Swanson. That was the, the reason I'm not a SpaghettiO guy is because my mother actually. <laughs> Uh-oh. I, no, really, no, I really cracked, I really she, cracked she, open yeah. these memories for you. No, no. I mean, she made spaghetti, but she made it with like ketchup and butter. That was the sauce. We got to love that. Oh, it was amazing. You have to I love mean, it, to this day, you know, that, that still would taste pretty good to me. Well, what I want to know, Rob, and uh, as I'm thinking about this, is is rice aroni still consumed today? You don't see those commercials of San Francisco treat. Right you don't on see the, uh, any on the table. like. I, I mean, when I was a kid growing up, I thought rice aroni was like the greatest substance in the world. I loved rice aroni. And of course, there was all all those ingredients in that packet were like you know chemicals from God knows where. But man, did it taste great! But I can't remember the last time I saw rice aroni in a store. So I don't even know if it's even still being made. I agree with you. Uh, I love the product. And you can go to a supermarket and find it still to this day, even though they don't advertise it, the San Francisco treat anymore. Oh, OK. Well, that's good. Um, yeah. Now, uh, uh, even before I even before we talk about Queens, because it's there's, there's something to we, we should as we put this thing into context for um for the folks listening, we're going to get to kind of like Queens so that people understand what we're talking about. But before that, 
Um, you, uh, I know from the public relations uh, business, it is your, it was your, or is your expertise. But I think Still. you, I think that you should. Uh, I think that public relations, like everything else in media, has has evolved. So, how do you describe now uh, what it is that you do? So, and it has evolved because my my title has changed. So, I'm now a brand communications consultant. Understood. Because what I do goes beyond public relations. It's about messaging. It's about writing op-eds. It's about coaching and presenting on panels and keynotes, especially over Zoom, as we've experienced the last couple of years. Right. Anything that involves messaging and clarity. And oh, one other thing, monetizing data. One of my favorite things. Right. And by the way, the thing that you didn't say, and I know that you want to say it, is that it's about storytelling true because Very i true. guess because you, you you know you know it's funny like people, it wasn't always that you would look at a website and automatic and fr- like and automatically see our story as one of the tabs on it but i think like in other words my point being that everybody that's basically out in the world you know has this has their version of their story that they want people to you know know about I would, they, they do. I have to be honest with you. Most of them get it completely wrong. Of course. Um, yeah, they get it completely wrong because when they, you, 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 you look for those, our tab, or those tabs that say our story and very often it might be two sentences or a mission statement. And that's not really a story. You're not really talking about what got you here. So, but that's okay. People, at least they understand that, that is, that telling a story is important. That's very important stuff. Well, I, I bring it up in the context of the Queen's Chef uh, project, because that's very much about, you, you know, stories. But before we even get into that, because that is kind of the focal point, mm-hmm. I want people to understand a little bit about Queen's, because I don't think that everybody understands the big picture. So let's start with the fact that we live, uh, you and I are from uh, uh, New York, New York City. Uh, which is a, I guess, the largest city in America, but it's made up of five boroughs. And one of those boroughs is Queens. And, and, it's, Queens, the lo- and it's the largest borough. And uh, well, it, 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 largest in terms of in terms of size versus population. Right. right. And, and but, but that size is interesting because it has become the home to immigrant populations from around the globe such that uh, it, it, it is the, uh, the most diverse city in in America, Queens is, uh, the most desert, the diverse city in America by far and potentially uh, in the world. Talk a little bit about who's living in Queens and how that and how that works out. Yeah, Queens, Queens has an extremely um, long history of being sort of a mecca for, for immigrants from all over the world and in all different areas, much more so than Manhattan, you know, we think about, you know, very often everybody thinks New York City is just one borough and it's Manhattan. But to be honest with you, you leave Manhattan and it is far more diverse. Um, So Queens always beckoned, um, you know, people from all over the world. For example, if you took the number seven subway train, which is kind of the people call it the International Express and it cuts through sort of the northern part of Queens, like right across um, from from uh, west to east. They say that there's over 90 languages spoken in the neighborhoods that that subway goes through in all the neighborhoods that that subway goes through. It's that diverse. So, you know, you, when you want to go have Chinese, go to an area that's Chinese, it's not just one thing. It's like several different, you know, regional types of cuisine. Same thing with, you know, South America. You have food from Colombia, Ecuador, you know, Argentina, it's, the diversity is unmatched anywhere else in New York City, and probably in almost the whole country. Yeah, I don't think there's any question. There's nothing close to it in the country. And and like I said, maybe even in the world, the only other place I can think uh, uh, that that has a widely diverse population is uh, Singapore, but they're drawing from the other part of the world. So you see, a, a different cultural mix, but but I, I don't know that they have. You, you said 90. I know that there's at least 100 languages spoken in Queens, and I'm pretty sure that there's about 100 different cuisines that you can get. Like, you know, we could talk about 
Yeah, I like what you said about Chinese, right? Because it's it's going to be Cantonese, it's going to be Sichuan, it's going to be Hunanese, it's going to be like it's like there's just Chinese alone. You have variety, and you it's also have you know, again you got you got Greek, you got Spanish, you got Italian, you got uh, what you were telling me, uh, Nepalese. So uh, uh, like like neighbor and it changes, right? Neighborhood by neighborhood, you, it it almost one area blends to another and it's not some not even even within neighborhoods rob to be honest with you because you go to an area like jackson heights and so you there's an area that's very nepalese and it's about 12 blocks long but then you walk about another block or so and it starts turning uh punjabi and indian like it just almost blends right. into these other cultures and so it's not even it's not even neighborhood by neighborhood. It's almost within blocks right. that it happens. Yeah, it's funny because I I assume that I never really thought about it a lot. I kind of assume that most cities are, are built this way, where people of a common trade uh, uh, aggregate uh, around a particular area. Right. So if you're in Manhattan, for example, you have Wall Street, which is financial. Uh, you have the jewelry or the design district. So, you know, a blocks and blocks. You have the flower district and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I, I guess if you think about Queens, it's funny that you go into a particular neighborhood and there are three dozen Indian restaurants or two dozen Thai restaurants or like little Nepal or whatever you want to call it. It's just it's just like it, it's the same situation, isn't it? It, it is. And, and the thing that to remember is, I mean, is that the food is incredibly authentic. Right. You know, Queens tends to be very, you know, Manhattan attracts a lot of tourists, obviously. So things tend to be sort of more Americanized and mainstream. But when you go to Queens and you go to these Thai restaurants in an area like Elmhurst, which is, you know, sort of ground zero for Thai restaurants in Queens, then they don't hold back on all the different spices or the regional things. Like you really... It's very, very authentic stuff. And I hear you. Uh, and I, uh, I hear you and I agree. And I really, by the way, I think you were the one who told me, by the way, that it was just named by somebody that mattered. Uh, New, York as Times, New York Times. New York Times. New York Times, right? New York Times has an article on what, like the 50 places in the world it, you want to go? What you want to visit. It was actually in there. They do it every year as part of their travel section. And for 2022, Queens was number four on the list, which should really tell you how incredibly unique it is. It is also unbelievably overlooked by people who visit New York, except when they land at the airports in Queens, but then they go right into Manhattan. Queens well, so, is so rich and so great. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm glad that you you uh, that we're talking about this because I want to take this opportunity to tell people who don't know, and I understand, by the way, people flying to New York and wanting to experience the Big Apple. I mean, that's natural. And you may want to do museums and you may want to go see Broadway show and you're going to want to go out to a fancy dinner and that's all fine and good. But that seven train that you mentioned or, 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 or is is a, I don't know what it costs. You. What's the subway these days? Like two bucks, two and a half bucks? Two, no, two, yeah, it's two and a half bucks. Like 250, yeah. 275. 250. That, like that. that subway train is 15 minutes or 20 minutes into uh, uh, one of the greatest concentrations of uh, ethnic uh, cuisine uh, in in the entire world so it's worth without it. a doubt or even if you're not like even if you're coming in from out of town and you go i'm not sure that i want to be on the subway for whatever reason i mean it's the same as the uber in from laguardia it's your you know 25 30 dollar 15 minute ride to get out to the the long island cities the elmhurst the flushings for korean food i just it's it's fascinating to me and um, and uh, and I and you uh, you you know you're friendly with uh, with Joe um, Di, Di Stefano who you know if anybody's interested and they want to get in touch you know in addition to the chef project which we're going to talk about here you know Joe's a guy that gives uh, tours of uh, I guess tours of uh, he of he Queen. gives tours he writes he consults with restaurants you know when Anthony Bourdain or Andrew Zimmern wanted to check out places in Queens they went to Joe to show them around. Yeah, well, that's the point. I'm only making that not to, so that people who, uh, yeah, yeah, people who want to, you know, take a tour of that. He's, uh, that's, he's, that's he's the guy. Doing. He's the man. Joe's the man. All right, let's. Um, I, I, I give me, give me three more minutes uh, before we talk about the Queen Chef Project because I know from watching what you do, even in social media, 
that you, uh, like me, spend a lot of time traveling and going to places uh, both domestically and internationally. And uh, obviously, as kind of people that are in love with, uh, passionate about food, uh, uh, you know, that's part of the, uh, that's part of that story. So you have been, uh, I know you've been to Chicago. I know you've been out to the West Coast and I feel like you've been to Spain. Talk about some of the highlights from those three region trips. Well, Los Angeles, um, I, I, you know, Thai town is phenomenal there. Nice. And I was fortunate enough to be staying in Koreatown. So you've got these incredible barbecue places. As I know you know, yeah. uh, the barbecue places in Koreatown are fantastic. Um, I did spend almost a week in Madrid right around Thanksgiving time. And, you know, just going into these amazing tapas places, just pointing to two or three things that look fantastic having the beer the the beer that they make there usually it's their own brew and you know standing up at a table and having a few tapas and having a beer at lunch is is just like heaven it really is heaven yeah. um you know and 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 these uh uh, uh the way the the spanish uh, cook shrimp also is phenomenal just phenomenal um san diego where i was for nine days Obviously, the Mexican food is unparalleled, and it seems that the further south you go, the closer you go to the U.S. You know, border there. Um, you know, they have the the Tijuana style uh, tacos that are uh, phenomenal, um, and you know, it's absolutely it's not that long a drive fr from there, and it's some of the best tacos you will have. Are they uh, are they fish tacos, Joe? Is that what we're talking about? They have all kinds, but the best fish tacos in San Diego by far. And this is this is definitely a, 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 there's two branches that live up to their hype. There's a place called Oscar's Seafood. There are two of them in San Diego. That is some of the absolute best fish tacos and cerveche that I've ever, ever had, period. Amazing, amazing stuff. I'm just uh, I don't mean to get uh, too granular here, but I do actually because, you know, I'm a food guy and this is the podcast about deliciousness. When when they make a, a fish when the when they make a fish taco down there like at Oscars, are they grilling or frying the fish? They are grilling the fish. Actually, they're grilling the fish. I prefer that, and I don't get me wrong. I love a good piece of fried fish, and I'm sure it'd be lovely in a taco. But I like if I'm going to eat a taco, I'm going to want it with the with a good piece of white fish, like like simply grilled, and then I'll amplify it with you know again your avocado your salsa your cilantro whatever else in a corn or i assume they're using corn tortillas for the most part in tacos yeah, or, yeah. they are they are yeah the soft the soft ones but it, unparalleled as far as seafood tacos go fish tacos of different kinds um it's hard to believe you could actually order a, a nice cup of you know cervation and and eat that and then get to a couple of tacos and it is just the most heavenly seafood meal you will have yes you do seem quite excited about it and i understand that i agree with you a, a thousand fold on eating in spain because um they have really delicious food there including the shrimp that you mentioned including um uh in, including uh, uh, seafood in, including uh, uh paella and great uh, uh, lovely cheeses and and, and good wine bistecca and bistecca beef you know, very <laughs> I'll eat that too. Don't get me wrong. But the thing where I was going with it is even before beef, these people, and I, and I, I don't want to start like a, a world war here because every country thinks that they have the best ham, right? Like Americans have, you know, our ham and the French have theirs and Italian, you know, the, they're, they're convinced that prosciutto, but I, if I, if it were up to me, the ultimate ham actually comes out of, uh, out of Spain. Amon. Yes, it's great so, stuff. It is great. So, yes. Yeah, so, uh, sorry, go ahead. No, I was going to say, these are all great cities. I mean, visiting, I mean, Chicago has got to be one of the best food cities in the country, yeah. period, hands down. Um, What'd you have over there? That's what I wanted to know. <laughs> oh, man. It's like, what didn't I have there? Um, the one thing about Chicago is, it doesn't matter where you are in that city. You don't even need a map to find food or restaurants because wherever you go, 
the choice is mind boggling and it's very entrepreneurial and it's incredibly diverse. Um, it's amazing to see a city that is so, so food centric as Chicago. It's incredible. Um, I always make a point of going to the uptown area to have Vietnamese. That's, that's to me, that's always mandatory when I'm in Chicago is to go is to uh, get that. Want to try, always want to try a Chicago style hot dog and go to uh, Perquads to have a uh, tavern style pizza because they have a very unique tavern style pizza, which uh, now they have a place in New York called Emmett's, which serves like Chicago style, not the thick pizza, but the thin tavern style. Really right. good. Tavern style is like thin, like cracker, like uh, uh, crust. It's the opposite, really, of the classic Chicago deep dish. Exactly. It is. It's crackly, crunchy and thin and it's good. Yeah. You know what? I'm. Uh, this is where Chicago, to be honest with you, is where Bistaker comes in for me. Like if I go to Chicago, I'm having I'm having I mean, I like Gibson's, you know, it's like old school classic. I'm having steak <laughs> and martini and I'm happy uh, in, in Chicago with that. But you posted something that I I, I I'm going to have to find because my my kid is out there and I'm going to go out and visit. You posted something that was like, I have to go there. And it was ethnic. And it was, it felt to me like it was, I don't, I don't, you'll probably, it felt to me like it was ethnic and it was like there was cheese and it was stir, like, it was like a weird combination of a ton of different foods. And I don't know if it was like on a sandwich or on a plate, but I'm, I said to my kid, I got to go here when we get here. Wow. Okay. I don't remember. Don't worry. But don't worry sounds... We'll find it. All good. Sounds, oh, sounds amazing. Or, or maybe it was, um, you know what? One of the great things I had in, maybe you asked about this because it was absolutely an incredible highlight, you know, going to Chicago's Chinatown and they have this dish called um, Jai Bing, which is this big pancake that they roll like sliced hot dogs and all these ingredients. That was it. And, like, a whole yeah, that was stuff. it. That was is it. That Tell it? me about that dish. Oh, well, there you go. They wrap it up. You see, it's it's in the it's on the second floor of this like semi deserted mall in <laughs> the Chinatown right. in in uh, in Chicago and of course when I show up there there were a couple of people there and as I was waiting for mine to be made a few more people were coming like people for food they will find out even in you know if if a mall is deserted they will just show up they'll get up there and go and and it's just the most that is. One of the most delicious things I've ever had in Chicago. It is not a neat thing to eat. You have to be careful because it's wrapped. But man, it is killer. Yeah, that's I listen. I, I'm that's fine. Now you got to explain to us wh what it is. All I know is that something is wrapped. What what are we eating? So so they 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 have like sliced hot dogs. Uh, uh, the the one that I remember very distinctly is you know they will split the hot dogs and they'll put that there. And they'll put sort of rice and lettuce and all these like amazing sauces. I mean, it's almost sort of like, think almost like a burrito, you know, think of like an Asian burrito in a way. Um, and, but they just wrap it up and they cook it fresh right there in front of you on, the, on a flat, you know, on a griddle. Uh, uh, and, and they just roll it all up and it is a big, incredible tasting mess, but it is highly recommended. Yeah, that's that's where I, I'm going to go visit, and I'm that's what I, that's one of the places that's one of the places I want to just on on a on a slightly off subject, uh, well the same subject but a different angle on it. How do you feel about street food as a rule? There's there's no rules on street <laughs> there's no rules on street food. I mean, you're talking about wait wait are you talking about like sabrats hot dogs? Or are you talking about yeah? Trucks, I'm talking dogs? about the fact that for people who are going to come to visit, you know, New York, they should know. And we all do this, you know, we all do the same thing, but people who come to visit New York, you know, those guys that are selling the hot dogs, we call dirty water dogs, right? So right. what I'm saying is that every every place has like street food. It's become over the last decade, like a real thing, like, uh, you know, award shows now for guys that are cooking foods at a truck or your lady that we're going to talk about in a minute, the, the Arepa lady. But I'm just saying as a general rule, uh, what do, what's you, you, you'll eat street food, basically, is what you're saying. I will. Well, food trucks are one thing. And I love food trucks. Who doesn't love food trucks? Because some of the great, you know, these are really usually homemade, you know, home chefs, you know, right. entrepreneurial types who are doing their 
you know, kind of running their profession out of these trucks and very often amazing, amazing stuff, you know, Beria tacos, uh, you know, all kinds of stuff. As far as the dirty water dogs go, you know, I, my, my, my feeling about that is if there, if you absolutely have to get somewhere like a, a show, like a theater show or something like that, and you've got 15 minutes and you have nowhere else to go and the line's too long at the pizza place, you grab a dirty water dog, you have that and it's fine. It's to me, it's more of like a band aid because if you want great hot dogs, there's no shortage of great hot dogs right. in New York City. Right. I um, think that's kind. Of, I think that's kind of the point. But a, I mean, every it's a desperation city, play. Yeah, I mean, it's funny because like every city has it. I was in. I took a, one of those uh, uh, one of those uh, press trips to uh, Portugal, and one of the things that stood out for me was that we went to a winery, and outside of the winery. Um, th th was the was the guy, and they do this in, in Lisbon, or it wasn't even Lisbon, but it's irrelevant, it was the guy that was roasting uh, chestnuts. Like they roast chestnuts. So they serve you, you, you know, roasted chestnuts that are sprinkled with salt and, and you're having it with the wine. And I'm like, this is the, that was my ultimate, you know, experience over there. Anyway, all right, enough about that. Let us get into this thing that you came up with, that you, thought about that you conceived of created four ways by the way to say the same thing um uh, uh and then you and then you executed that's really the important part it's called the um the queen's chef project tell people what they what they should know about the queen's chef project please so the, the queen's chef project is an online exhibition where 50 chefs of many different nationalities and many different locations within queen's tell the story of the most uh, meaningful object in their kitchen or restaurant uh, in their own. So it's all in their own words. Uh, so if they're from different countries or things like that, they, you hear it and they say it. Um, and they also talk about a bit, a bit about their journey, uh, you know, to opening this place, the unique journeys that they've had to, uh, to opening their, their restaurant or food business. Um, and they're all incredibly unique. Some of them are cinematic and otherworldly, for lack of a better word. But, you know, people in the food business tend to be superstitious, like the way athletes are, about having some lucky thing, you know, when they, when you know, players get on a hitting streak or they pitch really well. You know, they have their equivalent of a lucky bat or a rabbit's foot or who knows, or they shave or they grow beards. Food people are very much like that, too. They, they have good luck charms. They have things that are tokens to them. They have things that have been handed down or they found and they hold on to them. They're very precious. And so all these are their stories, uh, uh, you know, all shapes and sizes from the smallest one, which was a, uh, a hand carved uh, duck uh, chopstick holder to a grand piano. So it really wow. kind of covered the wow. gamut. Wait, are you saying that somebody's uh, favorite uh, object was a grand piano and then that's in the restaurant? Yeah, they got it for free. <laughs> what is something? So go ahead. Tell us one or two or three of your uh, of your uh, kind of most uh, uh, memorable uh, uh, stories from the chefs in terms of what uh, what their uh, what their primary object is. Sure. I mean, uh, uh, there's a place in Jackson Heights called the Arepa Lady. Mm -hmm. uh, that makes these phenomenal South American arepa sandwiches. Um, the, rep the original arepa lady was a woman for 20 years. She used to be a lawyer in South America, but she, when she moved to New York to Queens, she made these arepa sandwiches on the corner uh, of this very busy uh, corner and intersection for 20 years. And, and everybody knew her. They didn't know her name. All they called her was the arepa lady until finally her son said, you know what? You've got to sort of retire. You can't stay out here much longer. We're going to open up a brick and mortar place. And they inherited this incredible cup. It used to be a pot, but the handle was broken off. That measured corn flour, exact like there were no marks on it, no measurements. But for some crazy reason, it was the perfect amount of corn flour. And they still, that's the only thing they will make their repas with, is this old, 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 you know, little broken pot, you know, that turned into a cup. So there's, there's that. There's um there's a restaurant in Long Island City called uh, uh, Mandicata Rostica, and the woman who runs that Italian restaurant, there used to be a bookie in the neighborhood, uh, an old bookie who used to come by 
and chat with her outside the restaurant, first when she was growing up, and then when she opened up the restaurant. And he had always had a felt hat on his head. And then uh, he, he passed away because he was quite old when, when he saw, you know, he would walk by. And then one day, the daughter came by and said, I want to give you the hat because I know you had this relationship with my father. So, and I know you like this hat. So here's his hat. And she took this felt hat, which was, you know, then must have been 40, 40, 45 years old. She went in and she, she found a lining, the upper lining of the hat. She opened it up and found all this money in the lining <laughs> of the upper part of the hat. Funny. So she keeps that hat in the restaurant. Right. So you've got things, you know, you've got all these crazy stories. Um, you know, uh, uh, Philomena's, which is a pizzeria in Long Island City. The chef has an 80 year old rolling pin that was handed down through the generations uh, originally from Italy, but now he has got it here and he uses it to crush pistachio nuts because on one of his pies, and this sounds good anyway, uh, he's, he, he puts pistachio nuts on the pie and, and he keeps it there. Looks like a baseball bat. So these are examples of all these objects of meaning. It's funny, that one's because it's not even like he's rolling dough with it. It's just using it to break nuts. <laughs> break nuts, and who doesn't mind breaking nuts? Yeah, exactly. So right. there you go. Um, so, so, so that I have it right for everybody, the idea is that you have um, taken, uh, uh, I assume, uh, 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 obviously images, and I, there's probably video involved with, with this as well, like interviews and stuff like that. And you've there's a lot of, or, or, there's a lot, there, there are definitely photographs. I took over 17,000 photographs, but... Wow. Maybe about, you know, how to whittle it down to about 200 or so for the exhibition. Right. There's a lot of audio because we wanted people to hear them tell their stories. Sure, in exactly. In their own right. voice. Right. And, and, you know, a few needed interpreters, but we have the, not only the interpreters on the audio, but, you know, them speaking in Spanish or Chinese and telling their story. Um, and, and then there's some, some really cute video, too. There's uh, some really cool video uh here and there and so so that just to kind of uh, uh finish it up i mean i think you've you've created a uh what what did you call it it's an exhibition but it's uh it's completely online so where, where do people go like they don't have to even go to queens and they should but like where do people find the exhibition online so it's at queenschefproject.com well that makes sense and, yep and that's where you can find it. No tickets necessary. It's all divided up. There's some really great intros to explain why we did this and what it means and the things we discovered. And, and really the showcase is really the 50 chefs and their objects and stories and the visuals. And it's beautiful. So it's really awesome. And uh, don't be, um, don't be modest when I ask you this next question, but I believe that uh, it first was noticed by the New York Times, if I'm not mistaken. And then uh, right. I know that sometime, maybe, maybe even this very week, you were you were honored. You were given a, a, a award of recognition for the work that you did here. To talk about those two pieces. Well, the New York Times went live right around when the, the exhibition went live, January 26th. And then that just... Oh, you know, as you would imagine, just everything exploded and we had all these blogs and, you know, local TV. I'm still doing interviews, just did interviews with Japanese TV right. and um, which has all been great. But then like three weeks ago, I got a phone call from the Queens Centers for Progress, which is this uh, huge organization that helps um, kids who need rehabilitation and are disabled. And they have this huge, huge uh, fundraiser and they honor uh, you know, people who are very connected with the borough of Queens. And they said, we are giving, we would love to give you, you've been nominated by two or three people to get the Claire Shulman Spirit of Community Award, which was named after the late borough president of Queens um, for the Queen Chef Project. And I was knocked out. And so we had this big, we had this 400 people, this very big event uh, this week where uh, I got up, spoke briefly, um, got all these assemblymen citations from, from all these assembly, New York assembly offices and a great award uh, to go with it. But wow, what an unbelievable honor, but, you know, to be recognized for this work. 
Well, look at you, and and it's a uh, it's a uh, what do you call it? charitable, right? I mean, it's not like uh, it's a it's a it's not like it's commercial business. It's a, it's you know it's a charity that is very tied in with, like I said, helping uh, the disabled uh, in Queens, and they they fund like all this housing and all these things. And uh, the nice thing is, is that like the Academy Awards, I was given the award from last year's winner. Uh, he he presented it to me. So it was it was really a, a, just an incredible evening, uh, you know, and I brought my daughter so she could see it firsthand. You know, yeah, I, I get it. I, I meant I, I, I get that. I was actually asking about your uh, exhibition is is not is not for profit making. No, 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 not at all. No, no, no. I thought you meant the, the event. Um, no, it's not. There's no fee. There's nobody asking for funds. Um, the only thing I ask people is. Please support food workers and chefs and tipping cash. That's all I can tell you because they need it, for, you know, considering everything that they've been through. Um, but uh, no, it's a completely nonprofit endeavor. Well, uh, all I can say is congratulations. What a great, uh, what a great job you did, uh, 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 even without uh, all the recognition to to get the stories of the of, of the chefs and their uh, their favorite. Uh, you know, tools or equipment uh, to put it up on line uh, 50. I mean, it probably took, how long did it take to, you know, put the whole thing together start to finish? It started, my first shoot was on February 5th, 2021. And it took me a long time. To be honest with you, three weeks in early January, I had to run and do one other shoot because one of the chefs had closed the restaurant that I shot him at during the year and opened up a brand new one, this Singaporean place. And so I wanted to make it as current as possible. Nice. So about three weeks before I did a whole new shoot of him. So really almost a year, almost a year. What a great, um, what a great, great piece of work. Uh, uh, congratulations again. That's really, that's really impressive and, and, and awesome. And you deserve all the, all the credit and accolades that you get. Uh, so folks, uh, uh, for those who uh, want to see uh, stories, uh, coming from the uh, the chefs uh, in the most uh, diverse uh, city uh, in uh, in America, uh, head over to queenschefproject.com. And then for anybody who comes to visit New York, go ahead and enjoy the uh, the museums and the theater, but get yourself on the seven train or in an Uber because you're 15 minutes from uh, amazing food from around uh, the, the world. It's just, uh, it's just great. Now, finally, my friend, it's the uh, question that I ask generally of the, the professional uh, chefs that I interview, but I'll ask you because I know that you like to cook periodically. What do you I'm a professional eat? I'm a professional eater, Rob. I'm a well, yeah, but you, you do like to mess around in the kitchen, and uh, uh, <laughs> you do like to mess around in the kitchen. And as uh, uh, you know, my uh, my selling proposition uh, in the in the book Short Order Dead was that I have a user friendly formula. It's based and I can identify it in six words, Drew. It's most taste, fewest ingredients, least effort. That's my uh, that's my cooking style. So what are you making these days that has the most taste with the fewest ingredients and the least effort, so that I can go rip it off and do it at home? Mongolian beef, actually. Mongolian beef is is one of my very flavorful, easy recipes to do because we'll throw some some ball in there it's it really doesn't have many ingredients because and you don't really need that much you just have to you know tenderize the meat quickly and you know just really quickly and put it in a super hot wok with peanut oil and then you want you know the 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 sauce that you pour over it like i said it'll be some some ball some um dark and light uh, soy sauce some white pepper um and then some onions and you know, that gives it the kick and, oh, and sesame seeds sometimes, toasted sesame seeds, uh, you put at the end. And, 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 and man, that is, that's just flavor, you know, put it over your know, day old rice and that is the killer stuff. Right. So you're, uh, you're using a, a piece of steak that you have uh, uh, pounded and, uh, and, uh, and uh, cut into, uh, you know, small uh, strips or bites. That's fine. Cubes. Yeah. And then uh, you're going to put it in a hot wok with some oil. You're going to add uh, dark soy and light. You're going to add sambal, uh, which is a, uh, uh, a hot uh, pepper sauce. 
and Don't then sure, uh, yeah. and then you're going to uh, add in some sliced up onions. Finish it with a little hit of sesame oil and potentially some sesame seeds, which are better toasted than not. And there, ladies and gentlemen, you have Drew Reed uh, Kerr's Mongolian beef served with <laughs> yesterday's leftover rice. I'm starving yep. now. Uh, you have done the job. You have done the work. And I think for people, just a final reminder, queenchefproject.com is where you go to see uh, the project uh, that our guest today has put together. And again, um, really uh, genuine uh, congratulations because that's very impressive. You, you took your, uh, uh, you took your uh, passion for food and you took your professional uh, experience, which is storytelling, and you merged them into a project which benefits uh, 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 restaurateurs and, uh, you know, and, and the Borough of Queens. So uh, good on you. It's been a blast, Rob. It's been a blast. All right. Well, thank you for coming. And uh, and there you go. Appreciate it. Thanks for having me on. Well, there you have it, my friends. Drew Kerr, The Queen Chef Project. You know where to go to see that. And uh, you know where to return to hear more. All uh, you can eat. This was episode number 123, uh, all of which are archived on uh, iHeartRadio and Spotify and Spreaker, so you can always find there by... Uh, going to iHeart or Spotify or Speaker and searching for All You Can Eat or me, Rob Rosenthal. To find me directly, go to realrobrosenthal.com uh, where you can see all the work that I'm doing, including recommendations that I'm making about uh, things to try and things to eat and places to go and that kind of thing. So, uh, reporting to you from uh, London, England, coming back at you uh, soon with episode number 124, about London, England. Uh, I'm Robert Rosenthal, and remember, life is short, so never waste a meal. I'm the Teflon Pan Man. I'm the Teflon Pan Man. Ain't nothing gonna stick on.